Okay, so um, this session I wanted to cover, I just wanted to show some different swings <clears throat> on our software program so you can see that there's no really one way to do it. Uh, there's, 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 oh gosh, the tour's proven hundreds if not thousands of ways to, uh, between the LPGA, PGA, and, and Champions and, and the European Tour on that what will work and be successful, but then also all the players that are just really high-level amateurs that have found a lot of success in their games that, you know, that there's just a lot of ways to do it. And the, the main thing is that, uh, that you find the, the, the way that, that works best for you. Um, you will see, um, as, as, as we go through here, that I'll, I'll show you kind of the, some of the things we've been working on, some of the things we talk about within the private site. And then hopefully that'll help you, um, you know, really understand where we're going in general as a whole, but, you know, your body type will will dictate a lot about how you swing, your physical limitations. So although you may be trying to do something, you may not look exactly like this, and that's not really the goal. The goal is not to really look like anything. Um, there's there's gray areas we want you to be in, but it's still going to be, at the end of the day, going to be your swing. So we've been working on um, kind of the, the hinging of the right wrist. So I wanted to talk about that. Um, while we're on here, we're going to talk about uh, uh, posture a little bit as well. You'll see with Tiger, this is back when he won the British. This is, I think, went on a run for four majors. But this is the best swing that, that, that I have on video that or that I've seen of his on video. And this is when he was swinging, obviously, playing, putting, and everything as a whole the best. Um, so it's a good way to just kind of look at what's going on. Here's the, uh, you know, spine's really neutral here from from the lower part of the spine, middle, and, and then into the, to the upper. Um, you're going to, uh, most people aren't going to be able to do that, and they don't have to. You don't have to look like that to play great golf. You know, Kenny Perry, David Toms, you know, even Wes Short, and then, uh, which was congratulations to Wes um, getting a playoff this past uh, weekend and, and um, almost taking the win. But uh, Woody Austin, Woody Austin earned it and played played better on the last playoff holes there. It shot 64 on the final round to, to take Wes, but, but you know, they, they, there's a lot of players that you don't have to have this. But if you can, if you can work on this in the gym, trying to flatten this out, these are things that you should, you know, acquire, try to acquire. Especially if you're a junior golfer, you don't want to have a kind of a turtled up posture because uh, you have a lot of time to fix it. But it, it could be um, several things as a function of just uh, the way you're built. Um, it could be um, the, where you develop from weightlift. A lot of weightlifters will kind of have this rounded spine here from the way they were pulling on the weights uh, incorrectly uh, and so forth. So there's a lot of different things, but you can start to make those areas better. Um, and that's on the injury prevention page um, and also the uh, workout page. But also if you look here um, with Tiger, uh, you know, is is that's – and he flexes about right to the ball of the toe or to the tongue and shoe ball of the toe. He's kind of changed that different times, but in general, um, it's the right amount of knee flex relative to what he's trying to do, obviously. And then what we'll look at, so that's some of the posture things that we talk about. Now, there's, again, we're going to look at some different ones to show you that it's not just one way with that. Here's the right wrist angle, um, the hinge, as we talk about. Um, so as he goes back, camera is fairly stable. You'll see that this matches, this right wrist matches on the same angle as he goes into where the bend happens, which would be right here. That's matching that line. It's not on the line because it doesn't need to be on the line. It's, again, he's, it, it, but it's the same angle, and you can see, and you'll see that these angles would match. So if I draw a line through that, and the face rotation literally is perfect. So the face rotation being the side of the shaft, what we talk about this area, you know, is really good. Whoops, I have to erase that. But the side of the shaft is angled uh, correctly as well. So, again, this would be like we talk about this a lot on the webinars, like the 15-yard shot. It's maybe 10, 15, 20, somewhere in there. Then you can see frame by frame he's really not cocking his wrist. He's just turning and side bending up. This is where we talk about we have a video that talks about how the right life, the right lifeline of the uh, grip um, moves towards the seam of the shirt. A lot of you have seen that video. So I don't like to say there's really a model swing, but I guess this would be within what we do, you know, the model swing. I mean, it's again, it's coming back down. If you draw any of the lines that we talk about, um, 
I'll do that. Let me just give him back to the top. So we were drawing lines here. <clears throat> the seam of the shirt, there's that first plane you'll see. You'll come off of that. That'll match up. And then after halfway down, this is going to be anywhere. And this uh, would be considered neutral over that if that shaft angle was over that like pointing. I'll show you. Like so if the shaft was pointing here and the head was behind that, that would be underplane, um, which is like offers that play from under there. And then if the shaft was this way, we considered steeper or kind of over the plane, so to speak. If you take a look at the baseline, this would be the true baseline of the swing right there. Uh, it's really hard to capture that. Um, this You have to have good video equipment. This was a good frame rate, but you can see that um, this the club head is just just ever so slightly behind that uh, line which is going to produce a draw um, uh, the clubs right on uh, the, the the club is in that delivery zone that we talk about the delivery is really as soon as you come out of transition contain and deliver the same they come they're not the same thing but they're working together but you can see that this is where the clubs for the most part parallel to the ground and the next frame would be where the club head would pass this green line it's the first time the club head will get outside that hand ring. Uh, become uh, get outside towards the golf ball on the next range. So you can see again, even as he hits the ball here, um, this right hand is at the same angle. That's not saying it's bent. That's not what we're trying to talk about. But it's just the same angle he, that he started with. <clears throat> so everything really worked on um, really really clean lines, and just it's one of the reasons why he had even there you know really good face control. So if you look. Uh, the face control here is really good. And that's what he's trying to do. Um, this swing was the one he tried to model last year when he came back and he hired a new instructor. I don't know who the new coach was or whatever, but he just wasn't healthy enough. This is where he was trying to – I do know that this was the swing he was trying to get back to. This was the model swing that he was um, trying to get back to. And just – he, you know, he got he, – he looked like he was getting a little closer, but he, he certainly wasn't there. But everybody has that swing or has their model swing, and it doesn't. It ain't. It's not going to look like that. That's for sure. But I just wanted to show you, kind of running through some of the basics that we teach and so forth, what that looks like. Um, so you can see it from not only from the wrist, you can even go into the float. So if we were going, let me go back to here, play that again. We'll play it a little faster speed. You, if you watch the club. You have to watch with, you know, have a pretty good eye here. But at the top, I'm not going to play at full speed because you won't see it, but I'll play at this speed. When it gets up here, watch the club get suspended. You'll see it actually kind of stop. And then that gives him time to get his whole body, and that's the reason why his swing was far more in sequence there than it was this last year. Last, this last year's swing was too far too violent and transition and that made him narrow and transition and Tiger Woods does not play good golf narrow and transition he would tell you that but if you see it you'll see that club gets suspended if I slow it down even more which I can do you'll really start to see it that club is really slowing down and he you know he was one of the main guys that really had that when he first came out on the tour um, if you, if some of you remember that back in 97, he had that full pause at the top. I mean, he'd get that big wide turn and that club would, would stay put at the top and then he would come down and he was just like a wrecking ball. And he had the widest downswing on the tour and the widest backswing on the tour. Uh, and it takes a tremendous amount of mobility to do that. And if you're trying to do it superficially, uh, you'll probably run your timing. You'll probably, you know, I shouldn't say run your timing. You probably just won't have very good timing because your, your body, um, is not really ready for it. You have to train for that, and you have to have some natural ability for that. Uh, but yeah. you can train to create a wider golf swing with a big turn, you know, wide hands and stable transition and all that. You, you, with, but through using kettlebells and tai chi and so forth, if you just go on our videos. That that I say it all the time. The players that the best players that I coach are the ones that use kettlebells. I mean, the ones that train with kettlebells and lightweight kettlebells and focus on their body. And their mind, that's the best players that I teach. And they're not, it has nothing to do with age. I've got players that do, do that in their 60s, and I've got players that do that that are teenagers. Just um, those are the best ones that I coach. Most people that um, we coach will will sit in the 
the progressive ball striking page and that they won't move around. And, you know, you stay in there four or five, six months and you get your forms really, really sharp and you get your energy really good, but you're not converting it. And it's because the kettlebells will aid the timing and the mental game will aid to that. And we'll be tripping into more of that, uh, tipping into more of that than the next, uh, the next few webinars, you'll see me converting more to the middle game, how to convert things off from technique um, that you've been working on at home or at the at the golf course and so forth, how to convert all this that you've been working on. Because I think that's, it's, it is the most important. That has to determine your scores. So, all right, let's see. So we'll take a look at a few different um, swings here. Some basics, then we'll open it up for questions. You can see here's a good example. I wanted to pull up David Thomas. David Thomas is a very good ball striker over his career, but you can see a totally different type of posture here. You can see this, this kind of this turtle um, shape, this kind of you know a little shorter spine, more rounded in there. Um, the lower pelvis kind of working more under, not quite as that, not near as athletic as Tiger's. Um, but again, a, a really high level ball striker, kind of sitting in his heels a little bit. Um, but you know. You wouldn't want to get in a ball striking contest with him. I mean, it just shows you there's a lot of ways to do it. So, again, if you look at some of the things we've been working on, the right wrist. Now, he moves outside off the table a little bit like we talk about. But then if you see right here, again, he has the right side bend that would match up with the address that he started with. Here's that right wrist bend. You can see what we've all been working on. Just in, It's just a little bit outside, but by the time he turns to the top, it's all square. And then coming down. Here's the, that's not the baseline. The baseline's right here. And it's about one frame short on this, but you'll see the club head is behind that. That's because one more frame, the, the club head would be um, uh, right where you saw Tigers at. And so it'd just be slightly behind. And it's going to produce a, a slightly, uh, just maybe a two-yard draw. Or um, And it's hard to exactly say because there's still things that could happen. But if all goes well here, which I'm sure it did, I mean, he's going to hit just a baby draw. But I just wanted to show you a difference in, in the postures. Uh, this isn't something I recommend, but there's sometimes when you work with, when I work with players, this is as good as you can get them. Um, you know, they, you can't really, and if you try to get them to get the straight spine, if, uh, especially if they're a better player, it, it will really throw off their timing because they're not used to, they're not used to being that, uh, having those muscles engaged and, and retracted back and, and, and so forth. It's just a different feel for them. So you have to be really careful when you're trying to uh, do this. And that's why it's really good to do it in a gym format, not hitting golf balls. Um, work on postural exercises and then um, maybe work in the garage without hitting any golf balls, just kind of focusing on posture, learning how to turn and get staying silky, but, but uh, keeping, you know, uh, setting up in good posture. And that, like I said, it's not easy. You have to video it because you'll, if you're guessing at it, you'll probably, most people in general will look like this, but a lot worse. Their pelvis will be pushed, you know, a lot more forward than this, kind of poor, kind of curled up that way. And then you'll have the, uh, this is even more so, uh, they'll usually, uh, really bad posture, they'll tip the head way down toward, towards their, their chin down towards their shirt. Uh, so it can it can get a lot worse. Then you can get you're opening yourself up for injuries. And if you get too much worse from there, then then you won't be able. You, it really will cut off the swing. It makes it almost impossible to have good timing because of that. You can, but it was uh, it, it just it opens you up for injury. It, it you, no doubt you cannot rotate as well if the uh, in those in the worse the posture gets. Uh, from here, it's still good enough where he can still move around. And obviously, at the highest level and play on the on the tour. So, but. Um, so when you're studying your videos, these are some of the things you want to, you want to be in these gray areas. This is about as far off as you want to be right here. And then, like I said, I don't consider this good posture at all. I wouldn't recommend it for anybody, but it may be the best that you have. If it does, just, just work with that. You know, Kenny Perry kind of has that same type of posture as well. We're going to take a look at another player. It's another good one to look at, obviously. This is Jack when he got older. But you see it uh, still has some of this. It's still a different, a little more athletic posture, a little stronger to the toes like what we teach. This is obviously, this isn't a fair fight. This is when Jack was a lot older. But you can see a lot stronger um, core posture here, stronger legs. You get more angle kind of within what we teach. Let me draw that. So he's kind of angle more 
this way with his body than David. David was aiming more a little bit more like this with his body because of he was because he was curling the spine up a little bit like this with the lower spine and he was really curled in here. So this is a stronger posture, no doubt about it. So when he goes back, here's here's a good indication he, he's he's kept it on the table here. And then all of a sudden that right wrist will bend on the same angle. Uh, there again, the right wrist. You're going to see different elbow positions. There's different, and there's also there's players that do, that don't do it exactly like this. But if you take the high level ball strikers, you'll see like you can wing your elbows, you can lift your arms, but that right wrist will bend properly because then it takes away a lot of the uh, compensation through the ball. So it gets the shaft in a more um, advantaged position, so to speak. I don't like to say that word, but it, it, there's no doubt about it. it. There's proof behind it that. Where the side of the shaft, you, when you when you when you get the side of the shaft angled correctly, you get an advantage. It doesn't mean you'll be a good player, but it means you, you ought to be a better player than when you started. That's for darn sure. Yeah. Uh, Greg Norman. Let's see if we have you know, some. This is Greg Norman. Same thing. Keeping along the table. Nice wide takeaway. There's the right wrist bend. And then what, what, so the right wrist is still bending on the same um, angle that we talk about, but you see it's a different, a little bit different shaft angle because he's going more around with his arms, so it would look a little different. See, he's a little more around where Nicholas was going a little bit more up. This would have been, this was uh, when Greg tried it, was trying to get flat with his golf swing and all that stuff, and he was. His arms were getting a little trapped there, but in general, if you look, the right wrist bent right on the same play, plane that his arms were turning on, so... And, um, and the plane doesn't matter either. I mean, the plane's what works for you, you know. There's going to be players that play better more up, and there's players that play better neutral, and there's uh, players that play with their arms behind their shoulders like this, kind of flat. Uh, you know, it just depends on what works best for you. And with that, and the one, only way to know any of this stuff, in, in my opinion, is to try. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're working out there at 30 and 40 yards, you've already worked up your scale, is try a different arm pass after you've gotten out of the takeaway. You know, if, if you, you know, you'll try going a little more up, trying to go a little bit more uh, neutral, trying to go um, flat. And the only reason why I say that is because you'll learn, uh, you'll, you'll learn that um, what works best for you. And the only way to know is to, to, to try different things with that. The right wrist, you're never going to hear me tell anybody different about the right wrist because um, it gives you the, it, that is what, loads the side of the shaft and gives you an advantage but there's different arm rotations there's different um you know being flat neutral up um and when you find the slot with where you like the club to go and you're hitting it better that's where you you kind of go with it it's got a lot of that's common sense but sometimes people are just so afraid to change they want to look exact or whatever that may be uh to a certain model and there is no really there is no really model um if you were going to watch one earlier what i'd say what it should what everybody should look like, but it's not, it's not nobody, not everybody's capable of was with, with, with Tiger because that was a neutral golf swing, very wide. It's exactly what we teach and what we'd love everybody to be able to do, but we all know that even Greg Norman wasn't a, not even capable of doing that. You know, he played phenomenal golf, but very few can get to what he was doing. So, but he found it worked for him, obviously. This is Davis, kind of more traditional. It's kind of, pushes his knees out and those are things that even though I don't like this and the knees being out over the balls of the feet too too much here that'll change as he turns back into a swing you see it's the knee already went back because the reason why you don't need the knee flexed out this far is because it, it ain't going to stay there so it's going to flex it's going to turn and it just ended up going back to what would neutral would be but that was just something a habit that he created I'm sure as a junior golfer that, that it transferred up same thing keeps it on the on the uh, baseline right wrist bends up on the the plane and he again he works more of a neutral plane big high arc and then if you watch him coming down you got the baseline may miss the baseline it's a slow frame rate pretty close so that's close to it and that's pretty much right on the money uh, so when I draw this I mean it's literally going to be right through the middle of it so that is like a dead straight ball right there and that's what the baseline would look like and then the next frame the, the club head will break away from the shaft, that's the first time the club will break away with these high-level players. Is right in this out of the baseline, rides the table, and and off and off she goes. So today, I just wanted to show you just some different um, 
different uh, uh, postures, different back swings. I mean, I could go. On, we could go on and on and on. I mean, I haven't even pulled up some of the other players like Hogan and Kucher. They're real flat and narrow. And, um, there's just a lot of ways to do it, and the only way to really know what's going to work for you is to try. If you're having success doing exactly what you're doing, don't mess with it. But if you're struggling uh, and you're and it's in that 30, 40 yard zone, uh, if you've done pretty good 10, 20, so your baseline's good, you might start to add in, you know, a different. Remember, you don't want to get into rotating the arms so much as just your arms would not go a little deeper, which would be considered. I'll show you what deeper would be. So if you're if you're going into your your say that's a 30 yard shot, the arm plane would be right over if so if the hand points if you have the hands right here if they were more the same shaft same look same everything here was the same but the hands were right here that would be considered the actual hands that would be considered more behind neutral and if or if you saw a jack or like a jim furick it might be a hands over on this side would be a little more out front but the same the right wrist you still want to be the same this angle right here getting getting the side of the shaft angle properly gives you an advantage. I don't ever teach anybody. I'm not saying you can't do it. You have to do it on the downswing. There is no option. The right wrist will have to be bent like that, like we talk about. On the downswing, there is no option um, at some point. Um, it may be closer to the baseline where it happens with a few players, but the best in the world do it early and get it, get it knocked out so they can use that against the golf ball. But, you know, elbow position, you want to make sure you don't want to – one of the things I would tell you – when you, if you do try to work on some of this, don't roll the forearms. You know, don't don't roll those. I'll try to do that again. Don't roll those arms that way. Be careful with that um, when you do it. And again, video it and and study yourself and see see what works best for you. But again, the the side of the 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 right wrist is something, or the back wrist if you're lefty, it's the left wrist. That's what's going to uh, really determine in my opinion, going to really give you that feeling, that compression, like you're really using the whole club against the ball versus, you know, having that open face or close-faced and flicking at it or hanging on and, and not being able to use the whole club against the ball and compensate. So um, let me see here. I'll pop this open now. We'll open it up for, we'll open it up for questions now. And, um, you know, really anything you want to talk about would be fine. Yeah, it looked like Greg had a question that said my posture change was uh, was a slow change for me. It took a couple years. Yeah, you know, posture is tough. I mean, there's it's got to, it's got to work for you. It, you know, it's got to work. I'm going to have to mute it for a second. The the posture uh, uh, change is uh, – it, 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 it is tricky, and it's – yeah, really uh, – you, there's not a lot of things out there that talk about true neutral posture from the lumbar to the thoracic and to the cervical. And I'm telling you, if you study our website, it's all there. And uh, you might be in this program for three, four years and kind of ignore it. And all of a sudden you get in there and you realize, wait a minute, I just missed the golden opportunity because I'm telling you, if you want to, if you want to understand the spine, how it's designed to do and improve your spine and spinal health, which I think everybody on here should do. And also joint alignment, go to the injury prevention page. Um, it's as good as anything out there. I don't know if anybody's got one better because that's what the that's what the spine's designed to do, and the with every human being. Now there's going to be different limitations, obviously, with every human being. But if you want to know like how you're supposed to stand for dick golf, like just how you're supposed to sit, um, the angle of your shoulders, because most people have it, they they're really off. They think they should arch their lower back. They think good posture is kind of military style, sticking your chest way out and then arching, sticking your butt way out. And that creates this big cup down here in the lower part of the spine, and it arches, puts a lot of pressure on the cervical part of the neck. And anybody that, that knows anything about the spine, the spine will tell you that that is not good posture. But yet it's still taught out there quite a bit. I mean, like probably the mass teaches that. But when you learn what really uh, neutral posture is, and we're not going to go into it tonight, we've done that before, um, Neutral posture is getting that whole spine to line up straight, and then also the shoulders in line with the ears all the way down through the knee. And you'll see, you'll see the videos on there if you study them. And and you have to practice it. You don't want to just study and video yourself. And you'll see, uh, like, wow, man, I didn't realize that uh, my posture was so slumped, or where I was, you know, was arching my tail out, or I was cupping my pelvis in, or whatever I was doing. It. So. You know, it can really help you because the the cleaner your spine is, and and uh, uh, the the, the, the better you can move around it when you're training fitness, 
Uh, so if you're in a yoga class, most of the yoga instructors aren't going to catch it. They'll catch some of the basics. But what we have on our site uh, kind of gets beyond the basics. It, it, it'll help you anything, anytime you move, um, you'll understand there's a certain way to move that's the most efficient. It's not the only way to move. It's just the one that's most efficient. And so I think that'll help a lot of people on here. And um, There's no doubt it will if you study. If you study and practice, it'll help you for sure, no doubt. It's not the... It's not what's going to make you good, like the fastest, like that's going to be the ball striking part. But I'm telling you, if you add in the, the understand the injury prevention, you, you train and then you train, start understanding how to work with a kettlebell and do the postures correctly in a kettlebell and then start the kettlebell training. You're, you do the kettlebell training um, and, and it's just like the perfect synergy with what we're doing. Um, I've seen it happen for I don't know how many years now, 12 plus years that we've been working with the kettlebells and it, 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 it just, uh, it's clockwork. You don't care who you give them to. You're working with them. Some players kind of tapped out with where they're at. That just gets them to the next level. And it's also good because it gets them thinking, from thinking about the golf swing. It just allows them, they start to trust their body and the flow of their swing more than they do just trying to like hit positions or, um, you know, trying to hit, you know, whatever it may be. So let's see here. Okay, we got any questions? I forgot to tell you. Oh. Yeah, no questions, huh? Something in the chat there, Matt. Oh, okay. Yeah, one of the questions was, um, I, I'm having issues with the right hand dominant uh, when when playing. Um, it just. And what should, you know, uh, what should I train and what with that problem? And, and the answer to that would be the, uh, you'd want to train the D-cell uh, training. So, you know, where I, there's a, one that says D-cell, D-cell, D-cell. It's on the private page. And um, it what that does, and every just about every player on here, especially the ones that have been really successful, they'll tell you that's the hardest one that they've, that they've, uh, that they do. Um, but it's also like the most important one because it, it, it breaks down a lot of times players don't understand why they're doing it. Um, I, I, you know, I could go on and hours and hours and hours on why to do it, but I don't think that's near as important as just getting out there and just doing it and, and experiencing it. Um, it changes the energy in both the shaft and the body. Um, when players are accelerating, they're accelerating with the, with the tip of the club. So the right hand is a function of, so I mean, it, this right hand is a function of, of this right here. The brain's wanting to fire this forward uh, to get to the ball. It's trying to fire it to square the face, and it's trying to fire it to get the energy out. And that's exactly where it's doing the, uh, what it's doing. And so it's doing what you're trying to do. But the energy really where you want to be really good is right here in the side of the shaft in the middle. Okay? That's, the, that's the secret because this is what you're trying to swing and resist on the downswing. And that takes care of all this stuff. But when you're using the energy, an amateur will use this energy up here. And the pros are going to be using this energy. And that really, but they're using this because they're holding it. But this is where the focus is. It's where the torque is. That's why they torque this portion of the shaft. And amateurs are torquing this portion of the shaft. So... I, like I said, I could go on and on and on about the D cell and why and how and that you just got the you got the nuts and bolts of it right there. It'll also change the body because um, the body won't move properly whenever you're whenever you're casting this and accelerating. Whether even if you're not casting it, you can have it where you're not casting it, but all the energy is locked up in the face. And I've seen that quite a bit too because they're not they're not using the energy in this portion of the shaft. So it'll the when when they're using this the club head, then the body won't move. It won't have the same flow to it. When they use this portion of the shaft, the body starts to mil kind of like get silkier, gets better. And so um, 
that's really what the desail is all about. It's I know it's difficult. I know it's hard to find the the time and contact point and all that. That's the whole point because if you can't do it, if you can't do it doing a, something simple as uh, kind of a slow motion, there's just really no way. When you go faster, there's not really. I'll put it to you this way: I've never seen anybody that that, uh, that could do it fast that does it puts the energy on it properly that can't do the desail drill. And I've never seen anybody that, that can't do the D-cell drill that just is a really elite ball striker. You know, like a, a good, let's just call it an amateur, relative to their talent level. So my point is with that, um, if that's the case, and we have a fact that if you can't do it, then you don't want to quit doing it. You want to figure it out. And how you figure it out, it doesn't really matter. You, your, your brain will figure it out. You just have to stay with it. So my point is, was be take a sand wedge out and practice on, you know, swinging from 10 yards doing the D cell to all the way trying to do 50 yards and then decelerating through it. Your, your goal would even on, you might have a, you might have a zone five backswing, like a really long backswing with that same way. But if you watch that video, I only hit the ball like 10 yards, but uh, you know, and so I'm trying to, what, what you're trying to do there is you're trying to get the body and club to work together and you're changing the energy instead of you um, using this part was when you use the club head, that's going to activate the right hand. When you use this portion right here, portion of the club, what happens is there's more resistance in the hand, so you don't get that big flip through the ball. Okay, you don't get that, you know, that 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 right hand flying through the ball. Uh, the right hand flying through the ball. Um, the reason why we've had so much success with the D cell training is because good players know they understand. They know that right hand. That's just acceleration of the. That's premature acceleration of the club head. That's it's this energy right here. So um, they understand by when they decel, this puts resistance in this portion of the shaft and then all of a sudden they have more control. This is more control through the ball. And that's what you're that's what you're going for. So I would tell you to work with the um, decel drills. And uh, in you in if you can't feel it then you gotta video it. And you gotta look for speed. You should see a speed change. You're, when I demonstrate that, um, watch watch that video because I talk about it right off the bat. Everybody that thinks that they're doing the D cell right is they're not. They're always going too fast. And the players that train with me either online or the players that train with me um, here at the course, they know when I I mean I'm drastically make them decelerate. So the I want to see the downswing truly slower than the backswing when you're doing that. Your backswing I don't want it to be slow because then it means your downswing is going to be too fast. So your backswing will be normal speed. And then your then your your downswing. I want to see change gears like the first gear and just kind of go slow motion through the ball. And it's just it's to help teach you as a player where the energy is coming from. Where am I losing that? Why is that? Because you'll find when you're decelerating, you you won't find that your right hand might be popping up. But but if it does, it'll be because it tried to push punch acceleration at the ball. And then when you learn to control that, that's when you're going to have control of your hands again. Let's see if we got any more questions. Okay, here. Okay, I opened it up again for um, questions here. So fire away if you have an audio question. Yeah, hey, Matt, it's Greg. I, I do have a question, and it's uh, something that I'm struggling a little bit with, um, and it's... Uh, I think it's early release, and so my question is, and I, there's probably a number of things that can cause it. One of the things that I've looked at in some of my videos is I'm thinking that perhaps at the point of release, release point, I may be stopping my move through the ball for just a smidge rather than c continuing rotation through the ball. Will that hurt my release point and cause me to possibly pull the ball or I don't want to say flip because I don't think I'm flipping but I'm definitely releasing it um, where it's going left we'll just say that's my miss yeah um, what yeah. I'd say uh, typically when when you when, when somebody's releasing the club so if we were if we were if you're drawing this here and that's so right here what Greg's saying is his club would be kind of dropping instead of where it's slightly up here you don't want it to be way up here you know but it's probably one one frame less his club would be kind of dropping out below the hands um and you you that problem like it'd actually be right here would be better that's the perfect um 
place where you'd look at kind of the effects, not the not the fix, but the the um, the uh, the effect. It's kind of where the butt of the club's in line with the outside portion of the right leg right here. The club is up just just barely above parallel at this point. And the, the next frame would be releasing, but right here, Greg, Greg's club would be releasing. You would see this downward, so it would be an early release. That tra that will track back up to 99.9% .9 of the times to transition. It will not be. The fix isn't trying to get it here. And the stall is the body. See, the, here's where players, and this is really important. I, it, it just is what it is. It's a fact. If the, the body's not causing, the, the stall is not the problem what happens is the brain knows it's called the super stiffening effect in biomechanics and there's been all kinds of testing and data on it. when that club when you release anything if it was a hammer throw a discus or whatever the body stiffens up that's why the greatest in the world don't do it till they the release point so what happens is is if greg cast here like this early and he's been, you got to realize that's been casting. It didn't cast there. It's been casting all the way out of transition. You just don't see the effects of it until here. But when it casts, the body stalls. The body won't move. So it, because what happens is when you're trying to release something, your brain understands it's trying to release energy. When it's trying to release energy, it stabilizes for the strike. Well, the problem is, is the state when it's doing it from way back here, you see the effects here. The body's been stalling the whole time. So you'll see somebody that doesn't move hardly. And then all of a sudden, they flip the club through the ball like this with their hands, and then their body, you know, whips around like crazy. And you think, if you saw it from a distance, you think, man, they got a great turn. But when you break it down by video or 3D, you realize they don't turn at all. And my point is with that, um, going back, to the solution to that is to check your transition. Because what happens is, right here, if you notice with 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 Davis here what happens is there's a slight delay in transition that's that slow down effect so if I play it um, I may have to go to this isn't a really good quality video I may have to go to another one well we we'll use it for now but what happens is he slows down in transition and what when so when he comes out he's able to keep this width this this really wide uh, range and that width and also mobility, this isn't just swing, but he's able to keep a big range here. Um, but he hasn't given up the right wrist that he created that we showed earlier. So his right wrist has stayed the same, but his width has is, is stayed really wide. Where you're at right now is your club would probably, well, just knowing you're swinging, it would collapse down a little bit, so the wrist cock a little bit here. And then the club's rebounding out of that this way. So it's kicking back out. So as the shaft, the shaft's coming back out, it's going, it's cocking back, and then it's kicking back out on you. And when it kicks back out, um, it, the, it's starting to go so fast that um, you can't find it. And so when you look at it on video, you go to say, "Huh, let me look at that on video." You'll see when you get down to here, which is really kind of the end, you know, point of what is, is it good or bad. And most players' club will be below their hands, but it's because they didn't stabilize and transition. 99.9% .9 of the time, that's a transition issue. It's not that they don't really have enough lag. Um, it can also be um, it can also be physical. I've seen it with uh, joint limitations where guys are really tight and stiff. Um, that'll cause it. But again, that just is the same thing. It goes back to it affects transition. If your transition speed is slow and you let everything collect all together. Uh, your your angles and a good drill is just take a video and and, and uh, uh, pause at the top and let everything hold and make sure it's holding. You can't have any movement at the top. Full backswing, hold at the top for three seconds, nothing moves, and then take a video of that and, and watch it. I, I guarantee you the player's lag will be fifty percent better. And you don't you know and so and fifty percent better is fifty percent better. And um, especially with a player like Greg, sorry, a really good player. So. Don't really look at here like what happens is uh, what we see is guys will see their body stall like this and teachers the same way. They'll see their body, the player's body stall, and then they try and say, oh, speed up your body. If somebody tells you to speed up your body, get up, get out of there and run because it is, it is the last thing you want to do. You, the more you speed your body up here and you're dumping your club, the more you're going to dump the club and the less support you're going to have at impact. Um, you, um, 
that's just the bottom line. I mean, your your body's doing what it's designed to do. When you release early, your body's going to stall. So if you try to spin your body, well, then you're doing an unnatural movement, which is going to create uh, havoc. So most people, when they would do that, a high-level player would shank it. Uh, they would go to hitting a flip hook, big pull. Um, it just get worse and worse and worse because there's too much disc in it. So um, the fixing the lag, slow down and transition, let it fully collect, let everything get centered, make sure that there's no... Uh, there's no leaning left in transition with your body or, um, you know, spinning the hips um, early. Make sure that, that everything settles right over the center here. And that was one of the questions was, what's the center? Well, the center is always, your, you know, really your nose, uh, unless you're leaning your head way back one way or the other way. But it's just the center of your body. What, what, where does everything rotate? It's just the center, right, over, right in through the middle of your head. That's what the center is. And so when you get in transition, you don't want that to be moving left, that center to be moving left. In transition, you don't want it to be moving right. And then he's he's right there. He's collected everything, and now he can start to gradually move forward. And that's where you'd see him come in alignment where you wouldn't have the, the flip here. And the D-cell drill is good for that, too. It's still, it's, if you do it right, it's 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 the best, you know. Uh, but also, there's just different, you know, like just practicing that float, you know, the float, the slow down effect um, with the sandwich. Let everything stop. And you'll start to get better, and then uh, of course joint joint mobility will help that as well. Um, the joint mobility would be the thoracic portion of the spine. That's the middle portion of the spine. You want lower core strength and and good leg strength. Those three things will um, will make it where your body and club work more together. So. That's perfect for me. Thank you. All right, thanks. Yeah, you you got. Yeah, you're right on. <laughs> do, do a video, um, Greg. I would just tell you in our next web, uh, webinar, just give me a little. Uh, let me know how how it went, but take a video of you just doing a stop by pause drill like a seven hour, and just see what it looks like. And if the, if it's better, uh, then that means that it's a transition issue. If it's not, then uh, maybe have you send me your swing or whatever. But I, I, it'll be the transition. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. Okay, man. Do we have any other questions? So uh, the next webinar we're going to be talking about the process because we're, we're right in that playing season now for, for most players. And so we're going to be really trying to uh, convert um, the mental side of how, where the process is kind of like what, where you're spending your time, like how much you practice, how much you play, that's different for every player on here, but I'm just going to give some rough references and some things that you need to do that great players do. When I say great players, not these players, these tour players, these players like, you know, the Gregs of the world. Greg's a really good player at his club, um, good amateur golf and what they do and what made them, you know, you know, anywhere from a scratch golfer to a one or two or three and the road that they took to get there. Um, and that's his, that, that's actually far more important Um it's well it's really it's a the process that it, we all get caught up with technique and all this stuff the technique the technique won't teach you the process i could teach somebody what the process is take two guys the same talent they're both 100 shooter you give me three years with them and i never get to teach them technique but i, I one goes all technical direction and the other one goes all just the process just the way you spend the time um and where you spend it at the one that's doing that, the, the person that's doing the process will drum the other person that's doing all technique. Um, because the one that has the, that's all technique is going to have the swing that looks the best, and the one that's doing the process is the one that's going to be playing the best. And so you, the, but the technical part will, is a part of the process, it's just not the process, like most people think. So um, I think this, when we transition into this, the process over the next few weeks, um, you'll, you'll be happy with what you see and hear. And it's just a matter of going and putting your time in those areas, and you'll see, um, you'll start to see changes and more converting your techniques um, from not only like the range or short game area, but also into your scores and so forth, which is really what this is all about. So if there's no other questions, then we'll, we'll wrap it up, and then um, I'll see you here in a couple of weeks. We may have a... Um, uh, I think we're going to have a webinar this Thursday. We're trying to put it together uh, with Chris, uh, the hitman, Amon. He's the 
and long drive guys, won a lot of championships, just really super, super duper guy, but uh, really knows the body and he's trains in our program. So he's, he's a member of our online program as well. Just uh, David is also a part of our program as well. So uh, one, one of my students, I didn't say that last week, but he's also a student of mine as well. But um, anyway, we will probably have that on here. So, so be looking for a potential email for that um, uh, either tonight or tomorrow. And that would be Thursday at six. And I hope it works out. And if you don't get an email, we just didn't do it. But uh, I'll probably send something out regardless that way since I brought it up. But uh, it's something if you can make it, um, you should join it. It's going to be, in uh, my opinion, pretty good. It's going to cover, or it's going, we're going to cover uh, uh, function of the body. We're going to cover the diet, um, how to train like isometric training versus full body training, um, kind of body weight. There's going to be a lot of things that's going to happen within that um, uh, webinar that I think that could really, I know it'll help you if you if you do it and you study it. So, but uh, hey, Matt, can I have time for a quick question? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's Matt from Chicago. How are you? Hey, how are you doing? Good. So um, I play best when it feels like my shoulders are on a swivel, like they move real easy back and through. Yep. Um, but they don't always feel like that. And when I get that feeling, I'm I'm playing great. Um, when I'm stiff and you know, and and I watched one of your videos today from YouTube, and it was, um, you know, you want to kind of pull. I don't know. If I'm I might be saying it wrong, but you want to keep the handle um, low and close to your hip, going through the ball. Um, I'm not sure if I'm asking a great question, but how do how do you get it where you feel like your shoulders are on, on that swivel, and and why is it that sometimes some days they are and some days they aren't? Well, you know, um, th there's a truth to that is um, w why it is like some days and why not. I, I don't. I wish I knew. I'll tell you what my theories are, but I mean, just from doing it for so long is, and I'm a big believer um, that you wake up differently every day you even see it on the tour and there's days where I've heard, I've heard the athletes inside the the tour gym uh talk about you know I just you know they feel good and they play good and they when they feel bad they play bad there's a correlation to that and some days you're just a little little stiffer than others and you know even in the martial arts in tai chi they talk about that's chi flow and there's that's when chi blocks get into the body um, then the the flow of the whole system just isn't as good. So I believe, yeah, if your shoulders are, and the thing is, if your shoulders, if you try to force your shoulders to turn better and all that, it won't work. Um, now, what I will say, the solution wise that I've found to be really good is taking a twenty pound kettlebell and uh, and doing some of the basic workouts that we do. And I would do it. You can do those every day. That's what's good because it's not enough weight that stresses the system. And it stresses enough, you'll feel it. But it doesn't build like, you know, this bulk or whatever. So you block or these big blocks. If anything, it it really frees up the shoulders. So um, you want to get the, the body warm enough in your workouts that um, that you can get good mobility. So if you're just doing stretching and um kind of piddling around most of the time you'll never get your body temperature up to where you're really even if you're if you could stretch for an hour and if you don't get your heart rate up to a certain level um yeah, it's better than nothing but you're probably not going to get much out of it you want to get your target heart rate up to a certain level uh where you're really good in sweating and all that stuff and then you start to add in stretching mobility of uh the thoracic and uh the shoulder sh shoulder mobility is very important too i don't say it enough but it, it is and uh the kettlebells take care of really just about everything and they, they even help with thoracic but that's the solution but um uh, the there was one what was the other question i know there was the question was about when you t can turn better you hit it you you, you play better what yeah you agree with well there's a there's a video you did that's that's not on the private website but a youtube video where you're teaching a, it looks like a couple college kids in a gym and you're talking about attacking the ball with your right shoulder for me it'd be my left because i'm a lefty but um you know, you're they're they're getting the club back well. They're they're, they're you know uh, slowing it down. And then what you have them doing is kind of keeping their the handle close to their um, hip. Yeah. On on the follow through. So you're like so they're keeping their shoulders moving the whole time, rather than um, 
swinging their arms down the line, they're, they're pulling the handle in yep. towards their front hip. Yeah, so what that is, is yeah, I know the, the video there. And so the thing is with that is that you got to be real careful because when you pull the handle, even on that video, with these all kids, all these kids have really good timing. So they're hitting the ball first, and then that's where the exit move would be slightly left. And it would only be, it's really not left. It's on the shaft line. It's on that baseline. You have to say, when I say left, it's relative to the baseline. It's just swinging actually on a straight line if you measured it from the middle of the shaft. If you measured it from the club head, it's swinging left, if that makes sense. Um, so, I mean, I'll put that question on here. Maybe we can do that, uh, do that on the, on the follow-up video because I think it would be good because it, it's a question that's out there a lot, like swinging left. And you don't just want to swing left. That won't do anybody any good. Most people swing left anyway. You want to make sure you make full contact first, and then after you've made contact, that shaft and the whole unit should be moving. It's moving actually on the center of the shaft, like on the baseline. But when you look at the arc of it from the club head standpoint, the club head is moving slightly to the left, so off of the target line. And so that that would be it. I wouldn't that wouldn't have a lot to do with opening up your shoulders. Truthfully, it sounds like more of a fitness issue, uh, just getting your um, there's um, getting your shoulders and your and, and probably your spine to uh, it could even be all the way down to the hips if your shoulders aren't turning your hips could be tight so I mean it could be you know, just working the whole body as one just getting it to where it functions I think you'd find um, conver that way you would be more day to day to day um, if you hit a lot of balls too if you go out and hit hundreds of balls that'll tighten up your shoulders um, we found that. Uh, to be the case as well. So you got to watch about being a rain. You know, I don't know if you're doing that or not, but I'm just saying if anybody's on here doing that, you have to watch about hitting lots of full shots because you, your back will tighten up, your shoulders do it, and you don't really feel it. And then it starts blocking up the energy, and you can't, uh, you're not converting even though you're doing things right. Because you, know, you can be doing things right, even what we teach or whatever, and, and not be there. That's just part of, that's part of, you know, that's part of golf. It's part of just, uh, what it is, it is what it is. I mean, look at Jason Day shoots 80 the other day, same golf swing. If you go in and analyze this golf swing, I'm telling you, you, there's no way, I don't care who analyzes, they could find anything different when he shot 80 than versus whenever he's won all these events and all these other things. It's just, you know, he just wasn't his day. You know, he didn't wake up feeling good probably. You don't, there's a lot of things you don't know that, that as a fan, like these are things that I didn't know before I went and traveled when I was, was, a, was a coach on the tour was, you know, once I was a coach on the tour, these guys are human, so they don't, there's nights where they don't sleep very well, they have family problems, they have um, kids problems, they have d d financial problems sometimes, um, they're, they're just all just like you and I, all the rest of us, they they have all these issues that, that we have no idea, and, and so when things are going great, it looks like everything's perfect for them, and, and probably things are going pretty good for them in general, but when there things are bad, there's there can be a lot of underlying things, and it's 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 really not golf swing at that level, you know. It's it there's there's things out. I tell you, the biggest thing is when players don't sleep. That's the big that when I when my players wouldn't when they tell me they woke up and they didn't they or they got up and they just they didn't sleep all night. That's a huge concern. Now I will tell you another one that's really odd though. Um, usually when they're when they don't sleep well, you can bet just about every dollar you got they're not going to play good, and that's uh, unfortunate, but that's the truth. Now, if they're sick, it's a whole different ball game. And I think my philosophy, my philosophy is that all the players know this. Good, play, great players. Uh, I think the general public knows it now. And beware of the sick golfer. And the reason why that means that when they when they're sick and they're a good player, they usually play their very best golf. And it's because I believe that their their mind is so far away from the pressure that they're just trying to survive. You know, they're just they're not thinking anything else other than that. Gosh, I just feel terrible. So they just focus on. Um, like a human would, just like getting by through the day. So they're not worried about the pressure. They're not worried about who else is out there. They're just trying to, you know, you know, get by. And that's my philosophy. Also, when you're sick, you typically take – there's there are medications you take that, that, that loosen or that uh, kind of numb the mind a little bit, kind of like a beta blocker in some aspects. That makes a difference. It loosens the muscles. But I think my, the biggest thing, which I'm not advocating doing that at all, but the biggest thing is that um, – um, that they're just they're focused on like just trying to get healthy and they're who cares what they shoot and then they go out and they tear it up so it goes back to a mental thing so but when they don't sleep uh not a good thing all right
So um, one of the questions, I'm going back up. I may, let me see, I'll make sure I don't miss any. Uh, Greg had another question was, um, let's see, what would you do um, get, getting your body ready for the day? A lot of it's just preparation prior to that. You know, if you're training, you know, th you know two to four days a week, um, that, that'll, that'll do some of it. And um, hold on just a second. I'll turn some of these mics off. Okay, so um, you know, prior to that, I mean, if you're training, you've been training for months or whatever, and you're doing two, three, four days. You know, you're training. One, you have to look at the type of training. Yes, we'll probably talk more about that Thursday. But um, you know, just warming up the core, swinging, and hitting golf balls is not. You know, uh, that's really not warming up. It's a form of it. It's just not really. It's certainly not a workout. It's not going to really stretch you out like you need uh, to be, and not going to develop your body like you need um really as well but um i would tell you what i believe and what i have with my players would, is a basic meditation you know where they spend 10 minutes the night before uh, that helps them usually with sleep and then we do box breathing um which is uh four inhales out four out four in four out uh, which helps the nervous system as well and then visualization on top of that so you just kind of slow the heart rate uh, you start to empty the mind. So the meditation that, that I'm a big believer in that I found worked, this worked really well with our players is the meditation where you focus on emptiness, where you let all the thoughts come in because um, you're going to have all these thoughts, these doubts and fears, or you're going to have, you, you could have, it doesn't have to be doubts and fears. It might be confidence too, but you'll have all this junk coming into your brain. And, and so you can't really um, relax and uh, yet find real good clarity. And so what I, uh, meditation will do is help, uh, and breathing will help players to settle down what we call that's the monkey mind where basically there's just like their minds going like a monkey jumping from tree to tree that's like uh, your thoughts going just jumping around in your head all over the place and you really aren't going to play your best golf when you do that that's why when you hear all these uh, great players win um, off the tour any tour they talked about how focused they were how clear everything was and all these things you don't hear them talk about man I was thinking of everything I was my mind was cluttered and blah 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 um, and that's the way amateurs play. So uh, my philosophy is to get the mind right, the body will function better. So doing some meditation, uh, some mantras, I believe, help with that as well. I believe it's as much about the mental on the day of as it is the physical. You know, physically, you're not going to go in there and do any kind of crazy workout. You might do a 20, 30-minute kettlebell workout and body weight with 20-pound kettlebell, something like that, do a little core work, a little stretching on the shoulders and spine, and, you know, just a that's a pretty typical 20 to 35, 40 minutes with a tour player you would see, or an, even an amateur. Um, you don't need to be in there for an hour, half, two, three hours. You're trying to work out, especially a day before a tournament. You burn your body out, and then your mind will go on you. So, you know, 20, 30 minutes, and then uh, do some good meditation before the round, and that has been a really good uh, combination from what I've found. Let's see. Oh, for me, thank you. That uh, kind of puts it in a nutshell. You basically want to stay loose for the round, but mentally is where you need to be strong. Yeah, mentally, in, in a, a really good meditation session, anywhere from ten to about that. For me, it takes about for me to really. So, for those that don't know about meditation, um, it, you can use it as a prayer. You can use it, however, whatever your beliefs are. It doesn't really matter. It's just closing your eyes and. And it's a lot, there's a lot of different ways. Now, I've had, with Wes, so with Wes Short, you know, um, we spent a lot of time uh, working on meditation uh, for his career on the Champions Tour. And, um, and it's paid off. You know, he's made a lot, he's made a lot of money. He's played, played well. But um, we didn't spend just a couple of sessions. I bet we spent, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 sessions just preparing his mind and, and so when you go into these meditation sessions what it does is uh, it, and it's proven it's like sleep uh, so what it's like a recovery mechanism your brain your your body's running hard all the time and it doesn't want to shut down and and so um, it's hard to sleep it's hard to do other things and then it doesn't recover and so you go through the cycle of just kind of average stuff and and can't move out of that you know plat can't jump out of that area you're in of average and so if you recharge the system, uh, the best way to recharge your system is sleep. And uh, the best way to do it if you're not sleeping is meditation or prayer. 
And then when you're doing that, you empty the mind and that'll just really charge everything up. And so when you come out of it, you feel like you have um, a lot of clarity, and a lot of calm, and you also feel like you have a lot of energy. Like you can, you've got that. It's not like you're calm and you're going to go fall asleep. It's like you're calm and you're like ready to go do something. And so it, it's like, you know, it's like some people say it's like charging your cell phone. And, and I, I really believe that's what it feels like for me. There's other things you can do. I'm a believer in the asking you shall receive philosophy. So I believe when you get to a certain state in your meditation, that's what we used to do with Wes. We would talk about him asking for what, you know, what he wanted and what he's trying to accomplish inside his prayer meditation. And, uh, and then you use mantras throughout the day to strengthen that to make sure you keep it focused. And this is really high level. I mean, but I mean, that's what we're on here for. We're not here to talk about what you know, 20 handicappers are doing out there. We're trying, I'm, I, what I'm trying to do on these webinars, it doesn't mean you have to do any of it. It's just like, this is what goes on out there um, at the highest level. And, and, and it's why you see, you know, players talking more about the mental game and the physical aspects of it now than you ever have, you know, really in the history of the game. So, but I hope that helps. I, it, it's helped a lot. Of, it's helped me, but it's also just, I've seen, witnessed it with players, you know, how it's really, really changed them. So, Let's see. Does the center center move forward? Uh, yeah, you know the the center. So if I uh, this is Tiger here, what I look for is when you get to the top of transition is um, from a technical going back to the technical side of it is I like the player's left ear to be. And it's not going to be a straight line. It's already moved the curve. It try to get it back straight, right in line with the ball there. So if the left ear was over here. Um, it's a good way if you're judging your swing, if you're analyzing, or if you've moved way off of it, which most people do, they'll have their left ear way behind the ball, and they're just not athletic enough to catch up because their legs and core aren't, you know, uh, coordinated enough. So if you're um, used to do this all the time at my old shop, is I'd have players just take it up to the top. Greg's probably even done this one, but and we had a TV right in front of them, and I would just have them get their left. I'd draw a line, have them get their left ear right on there. They can rotate as much as they want, as long as that that doesn't move. So that was like a good zone five uh, training. Now you'll see there is some movement. What you'll typically see out of this, they're not thinking about all this. It's just the, um, you know, if you're training your patterns right, um, your body's functioning right, um, they're not really thinking that. So you're going to see some forward movement at first. Then you'll see at the end that they start stabilizing. Now remember, what, go back, this goes back to what I said earlier. So an amateur might just run. So as they move forward, an amateur may just run on through that. So they may move that head another two feet. If you look with Tiger, he moves far forward slightly, and then all of a sudden, remember, he's not he does, he's not releasing the club until right now. And so now his body just stays still, and it just, if anything, maybe goes back to stabilize that strike, and then it goes forward again. So I like the head. The head, in reality, it moves slightly, but they don't they don't feel like they're moving. I can tell you that from a feel, and that you don't want to feel like you're trying to move your head two inches forward and then trying to hit the ball. I mean, it's just the you'll end up moving at eight inches or nine, something like that. So I would just tell you to uh, focus on try to, if you're uh, judging your golf swing in transition, you want that left ear right on top of the golf ball here. And then you don't really, um, when you're looking at it coming through, you're wanting to see more of the other stuff that we talk about. If you're circling around your body, um, we, the way we talk about using your feet, you know, that's going to take care of a lot of this stuff. But if you have heads drifting with it, it's no good. So if you start, if he was, if his head was to um, to be just right here, right now, or even right there, that would change everything he's got to do through impact. Or if his head was back here, and that's where Wes used to be when he'd start his transition, he would be way behind it, um, and it just it's actually what he did on his playoff holes where he you know hooked the ball off in the woods and it cost him. He got tired and he got it. He drifted off the ball in transition, and he couldn't get back up to it. So. And with a good player, that'll be a hook. So he got too far back over here. Head was back over here. I saw, I remember watching it live thinking, oh, God, I just I knew when he took it back. And he couldn't get back off. So it, instead of where you'll see Tiger moving forward through the shot, forward, like we talk about, he's constantly moving forward through the shot there. What happened with Wes was he got here and he got stuck and he couldn't get off his right side. So then next move was tossing that club, you know, flipping that club over. So.
Yeah, boxing. Yeah, Doug's uh, question, or not question, but it's like boxer shoulders. Yeah, it's just sinking the boxer shoulders are just dropping the shoulders down into socket, not raising your delts up and traps, and you know, you just letting them fall down, and that'll. That's a, been a really popular one for a lot of players. You know, really heavy, really heavy shoulders sinking right down into the sockets. Yeah, there, it, another question is like, now you don't want to try to spine tilt or anything like that. You know, there's not going to be, I can tell you, you don't want to try to do any spine tilt. You don't want to try to move the head forward or any of that stuff. You're going to see their spine tilt. There's natural spine tilt. Here's spine tilt right here. Um, it, the, the angle this but you're not you, you're not trying to nobody's trying to increase the spine angle on the downswing on the tour um that was a point back in the 80s where players were trying to do that and they were with the reverse c but um you don't want to try it at all uh i would just keep everything as level as you can to the ground i mean you want he wants to feel he's, he feels like this I'm telling you level his shoulders and he feels like he feels like this that's what you want to feel like they're just all on top uh, and what reality is going to say, in reality, um, you certainly don't want to be trying to tilt or trying to move your head or, or any of this um, stuff. You just really don't because you end up lost in the jungle pretty quick. Because spine tilt, when somebody does this, they'll spine tilt so far away from the right, then they blow their back out. You know, they'll be way back here. Their head's falling back. They can't get the club up the ball. Their low point's behind the ball. They've, lose lag then you know, i could give you other body stops there are all kinds of things so it goes back to sink and circle really if you study the tai chi patterns where you know where i talk about sinking and circling and it, I, actually everything we talk about on the transition to to the, the uh, uh, containment and delivery the, the sink and circle and how everything moves uh, that's how you would train and by doing that you would have a stable head your body your joints work more circular uh, naturally and then when you turn it loose when you go to play they work more like we talk about you know everything kind of works in a, that you just functions the right way so it's a lot of it you don't want to be if you're if you're having problems with any of this stuff and you're losing it odds are your, your body's um, you've got joint joint limitations that need to be taken care of through tra uh, training uh, so I would tell kettlebells of that uh, train with a kettlebell and also just train with a sandwich and if there if something else is going on it's not allowing you to do it it's not going to be if you're if your body's functioning right and the joints are moving right you're going to see more good things happen uh in your golf swing than bad things strong legs your, your legs could be given out and so you could see what your center would be changing there as well so it's not always it's not always what you think with with uh with form um and you can't always judge a book by the cover. I say this all the time. You'll see players like they were talking about Shane Lauer, and there's somebody was saying how he's overweight and all this, and and they didn't realize that he had a trainer out there that all week, and he trains like all the time. He just he's just a big boy, you know. He's got a little gut or whatever, but he trains I think five days a week on his body, trying to keep it. Um, and that was when he I think he was leading the Masters the first day that they were talking about that. So you never know what somebody's doing. Um, they may not look the part, but golfers don't necessarily. It's, that's been proven. They don't have to look like world-class athletes, but the way their joints have to function is. And so a lot of the training we do, we're not trying to run wind sprints and have 1% body fat, thank God, or I'd be in trouble. But um, you do, your body needs to be able to rotate and um, create torque. And, you know, have, the way you create torque is by having strength and mobility working on top of each other. And, you know, that's how you would build it. So, Looks like all the questions there. And we're going to be talking in the next uh, the next session about how to convert, you know, the techniques. We've been doing a lot of techniques. We've been doing a tremendous amount of techniques over the last six months, going over and over and over and over. And I want to make sure that everybody, and we have a lot of information on the private side about how to do it and keep it simple. And then we want to convert that and make it where you start to play not by correcting bad shots with form or trying to fix it form for a form. You just go out there and you start playing and letting it go and let just figuring it out, you know, letting it come to you. And then when you catch it, you know, you ride with it instead of trying to go do 10,000 reps a day of the, like a lot of things we'll see too is players, they'll, they'll, they'll catch a day where they go, Oh, I just, I made this one move and I'm going to do that all night. You know, I'm going to go do 10,000 reps or whatever, this move. And they go out the next day and they shoot a hundred because, it wasn't there, and that's very common because the good play. The, that's part of the process. These great players, uh, amateur golfers, I'm including with this, is that um, when they catch a run, they, they're, they're a certain player that has a mindset of like, 
okay, I got it. I just get out of my own way and play. Those are the ones that are very dangerous. The ones that are going to go in and go, oh, I've found it. You know, um, I got to go in and do this rep 10,000 times on the range tomorrow and I'm going to do it all night and all that. It, that's not really, that's, that's, that player is usually not very dang. They're not very consistent um, because they're always trying to fix it. It doesn't work. So they get let down this and this and this. When you catch a run, you just got to get out of your own way. And that's the best time to really focus on like the mental game, the meditation and the other mantras and other things. So you don't let your monkey mind jump up there and, and, uh, and kind of ruin it for you. So we'll be focusing on that the next, the next session though. But uh, I'm going to wrap it up tonight and uh, I, I enjoyed it as always and look for an email one way or the other for Chris Almond to join us hopefully Thursday. I hope it works out. I'm going to talk to him tonight and if it does, I will see you guys and ladies on Thursday. Great. Thanks, Matt. All right. You guys have a great night.